words of power because we are kings and our words matter. Even though you are born and you live, you work, you earn, do marry and have children and all of that, you go through the whole process, even death and all of that, but yet you don't, that's not your life. Your life is lived for a higher cause. You live every breath of your life for your king that rules over you. You are in the kingdom of God. You are living for him. And when you die, you still enter into the kingdom. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that. Still, I know. Be still and know that I. This is God's word for you. Be still. No matter what you're going through. the God that healeth me. Every time you feel that Jesus is very harsh and it's very unjust, then it means you're, you're, mis you're misunderstanding it. So you need to look at it. You know, the Bible scholars say the man is not saying that the father is dead. If the father is dead, what is he doing with Jesus standing there? According to the Jewish tradition, it is not allowed. If your father is dead, you better stand next to him and keep crying, you know. You can't be just moving around discussing theology with Jesus, you know. Uh, with your teacher, you know, that's not the time to do it. That's disrespectful. That's not the way you go through the morning. So his father is not dead, they say. What he is saying is, I have certain duties that I must attend to with regard to my family. One of them is that my father is getting to be a pretty old man. And uh, it looks like he may die any time. He's also sick, maybe. And he may die any time. He's growing weaker every day. So, in case he dies, then I need to be there to do everything as a son, to arrange for his burial and to do all the things that needs to be done according to our tradition. So, I'd like to follow you. You say, come follow me. I'd like to come. But I've got some priorities. Look at the words he uses. He says, let me first go, verse 59. Let me first go. One, translator say, one translation says, first of all, I want to go. That means my father is my number one priority. Yeah, kingdom, let it wait. That's next. First is my father. But Jesus says, seek first 
the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. The principle is this. You need to extract the principle. Jesus is simply using what the guy said with regard to his father and his duty towards his father to make a point there. You need to get the point and not just wallow around that, uh, you know, thing and get caught in that thing about his father being dead and how Jesus is not allowing. No, no, Jesus is not like that. The Bible says, honor your father and mother, right? So that it may be well with you and your days may be long on this earth. You'll be prosperous and blessed and live long if you honor your father and mother. The Bible has made the honoring of the father and mother a commandment, one of the ten commandments. It's required. It's one of the basic laws of God that leads to blessing. That's a commandment with a blessing. That's the only commandment with a blessing. So you think Jesus will violate that commandment? Now he'll say, don't honor your father and let somebody bury him. Because people take it like that. See, Jesus is saying, let somebody bury him. You come and preach the kingdom of God. No, he won't do that. Remember when Jesus was hanging on the cross? While hanging on the cross, he was mindful enough to take his mother and hand, him hand her over to John, saying, here's your son. And looked at John and said, here's your mother. Hanging on the cross. He felt it's his responsibility that before he gave up his spirit and died, he must do something about this and settle this issue. So you can't say he was not concerned about his mother. He had all the love for his mother. Some people take verses like this. You know, remember one time Jesus was with the disciples and somebody came and said to him, your mother and your brothers are waiting there, wanting to see you, waiting outside. And Jesus said, who's my brother? Who's my mother? He that does the will of the Father in heaven, that's my mother and that's my brother. So some people say, that's the way you should treat your mother. Tell her to go jump in the lake, you know, or something like that. You know, I don't want to attend to her. I don't want to take care of my family. I don't, mother doesn't matter. Brothers don't matter. Sisters don't matter. Nothing matters because I am in this higher call. Some people have taken it like that, you know. There's another verse where it says, if a man will come after me and will not hate his mother, father, brother, sister, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciples. You have all those verses and, and you know all those verses. If he does not hate mother, father, brother, and sister, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So a lot of people think that they need to forget about the mother and father, brother and sister, and the family, and they have no obligation towards the family, uh, especially some preachers think, you know that uh, they need to come out and completely be free from every obligation in the earth, earth, earthly obligation, and serve God in that way. So Jesus is not telling the man, don't bury your father, and your father is nobody, you know, to you, and you don't have to care about your father, you got this high calling in life, and forget about father, mother, and all of that, and come and follow me. No, 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 no. What he's saying is, this fellow is a typical picture of a guy you know, who thinks of life like this. It's a principle, you see, that, that father situation is just that particular situation there. But you must have a broad application. Jesus is talking about a broad issue. They're using that particular example. So you should not get caught in that example and lose the uh, big picture, you see. So what is Jesus saying there? Jesus is saying there that this man has got a problem like many people today have a problem. They say, well, brother, I, I understand that I am a sinner. I need Christ. Jesus is the Savior. I need to turn. I need to come to Christ, give my heart to Jesus. I, need, I understand all of that. But you see, I'm caught in this little thing. So it is the broad application is like that. Many people, for some reason, they feel that uh, they can't right away do anything about it, even though they realize that this is what uh, they need to do. They say, I want to follow you, but I've got all these things going on. I need to go and attend to this, and only later I can come and follow. And Jesus says to him, let the dead bury the dead. Now, we gave you the meaning for what the guy said. You know, I need to go attend to my father and bury him. That's the broad application of that is, I got some issues, let me deal with this first, give me some time, I'll come back later. 
and they enter into the kingdom of God. But the answer that Jesus gave, that also needs to be interpreted. Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. What does he mean by that? He, Jesus, is say, Jesus is saying, look, burying the dead is something that everybody and anybody can do. The world is full of that kind of activity. People are born, people are, you know, raised and go to school, go to college, get married, give birth to children, build a house and live and then die and... This is the thing that's happening in every house. People just handle this thing. Uh, burying the dead is a normal human activity that anybody can do. But you are not just called to live in that way, just living as the whole world lives. We are not just here to be just born and just go to school, college, and then get a job, earn some money, build a house, get married, you know, have some stuff, and then retire and then die. You are not called to be living like that. You are called into the kingdom of God. Jesus is your king. He rules over you. So even though you are born and you live, you work, you earn, do marry and have children and all of that, you go through the whole process, even death and all of that, but yet you don't, that's not your life. Your life is lived for a higher cause. You live every breath of your life for your king that rules over you, you are in the kingdom of God, you are living for him, and when you die, you still enter into the kingdom. Hello. So that's what Jesus is saying to him. He says, let the dead bury the dead means, that's a very ordinary activity. You, you, you are not to be living like that. You are not to be just engaged in a worldly pursuit. Have you ever thought about what God is got you born here in this world for? Why God has given you these gifts? Why he has placed you here? Why he has given you such power and authority? Why he has given you such clout and, and, and education and all of that? Why, 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 why does God have you here? What is his will? What does he want you to do? Do you think about that? He tells this guy, let the dead bury the dead. You go preach the kingdom of God. He's telling him, you're called to preach the kingdom of God which not everybody can do. The world doesn't know anything about calling. The world doesn't know anything about the Lord. The world doesn't know anything about a king who's God and Lord and how the will of God must be done in our life. The world doesn't think about that. You tell me how many people in homes are thinking about what does God want from me? What is the will of God for my life? How should I do the will of God? The worldly people don't think like that. They just get up, go to work, earn the money, pay the bills. Come watch TV, eat dinner, go out, go to sleep, then get up again, do the same thing for next 70, 80 years. That's all they do. No thought about God, Him being a king, and the kingdom of God, and the purposes of God, and the vision, and God's goals, and nothing, none of that stuff comes in. Not, not in the picture at all. Jesus is saying, then you're not a kingdom person. The kingdom of God is not like that. That is what he was saying when he says, let the dead bury the dead. You go and preach the kingdom of God. He's telling that guy, you want to be a kingdom person, then you better understand this. You better start putting the kingdom cause first, Jesus first, and the kingdom of God first, the will of God first. Don't tell me, first of all, let me go and bury my father. First of all, let me go take care of this, and then we'll see. First of all, let me do this. No, you say, first of all, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Verse 61, another also said, this guy is a very interesting guy. He comes to Jesus and he says, I'll follow you. There must have been plenty of guys like this around Jesus. He said, I'll follow you, but let me first go. He's got the same hang up, you know. <laughs> let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. Now what this guy is saying is, yeah, yeah, I understand, I need to come into the kingdom, I need to give my life to the kingdom, live for the kingdom, seek the kingdom first and all that, but the thing is, let me first of all go and have a farewell party. They wanna give me a farewell party. Now, I really need this because we've been very close over the years and we've, uh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, working with someone and being with someone for so many years. We've been very close together. 
I can't just cut off my past and break with my past and start something new. So give me back a chance to go back into my past and kind of do whatever I need to do as a final run, you know, in the past. And then I will come back. Let me go have a farewell party, he says. You know, but the thing the guy doesn't know is if he went for a farewell party, he'll never show up again. <laughs> because <laughs> because the, he will like that so much, he'll never want to come and do what God tells him to do. And Jesus knows it better. So he says, but Jesus says to him, look at what he says. No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus is describing the kingdom like this. The kingdom of God is like this. That when you set your eyes upon it, when you give yourself to it, when you dedicate yourself for it and determine to follow Jesus and give yourself to him, then you never take your eyes off of him. Kingdom of God is something that requires absolute concentration and focus. Keep following him. He must be your number one priority. Keep going. Don't say, let me first go and have a farewell party. None of that business. You put your eyes on him. Never turn back to look and try to go to your past and get back into those things. Keep looking ahead. Keep moving forward. Keep doing the will of God. Keep being dedicated to God. Keep pursuing his will and his kingdom. That's the meaning of that. The Bible talks a lot about that. You know, when you come into a Christian life, the Bible says, friendliness with the world is enmity against God. When it says world, some people think the world itself, you know, is something wrong. What are you going to do? Leave the world? You got to be in the world. So it's not talking about the world as such, you know. The world is God-created world. God made everything. It's God made everything good. It is now corrupted by sin and so on. But the thing is, what corrupted the world is man is the one that corrupted the world. You know. So, the friendliness with the world is talking about friendliness with ideas that is contrary to God, that is very worldly, that is very carnal, that is very ungodly totally contrary to God's ideas and God's way of living. That's what the Bible talks about as the world. Now let me read to you one more passage. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. See, it's talking about loving the world and says, don't love the world or the things in the world. Now things doesn't mean your car, your house and all of that, you know. You need these things. So you got to read the Bible, not for your own destruction, <laughs> but for your edification. <laughs> you know, the same Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God, all these things shall be added unto you. The same Bible says, the heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. What things? He said, don't worry about what you'll eat, drink, or be clothed with. So you need clothes, you need money, you need food, you need water and all of that. God knows these things. Nothing wrong with these things. And God supplies these things. So when the Bible says, don't love the world or things in the world, what is it talking about? It is talking about a worldly philosophy, a worldly way of life that is contrary to God and God's thinking and God's way. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, see now, you want to know what the world is? Here is a perfect definition the Bible itself gives. I don't have to interpret. For all that is in the world, and then a hyphen comes in the English Bible, and it, then it describes or expands on what the world is. For all that is in the world, there is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. What a summary of what the world is. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's the world. The Bible describes that as the world. The Bible is not telling you to leave the world and go some, to some other planet, you know. The Bible is not saying that this earth itself, you know, is something that, that will defile you and don't, don't stay here. No. The, Bi the, the Bible is not saying don't even have a little piece of land and little dirt 
You know, one fellow said, I don't want even one inch. You know, so how holy, you know. But he's every day walking on this earth only and growing what is grown there. I mean, uh, eating what is grown there. <laughs> and when he dies, they're going to put him there also, his body there. But he says, I don't want even one inch. He thinks that's the world. He doesn't want anything in this world. No, nothing in this world. I don't want anything in this world, he says. But, if, but the Bible clearly defines what the world is. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. That's the world. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. That's the world. He is not of the Father. That's not of the Father. That's why it's called the world. He is not of the Father, but is of the world. That's part of the world. That's the world the Bible talks about. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides for ever. Now, a great example of this exhortation to not look back. Jesus says, if a man puts his hand to the plow and looks back, he's not fit for the kingdom of God. Great example is Lot's wife. That's why Jesus in the New Testament says, remember Lot's wife. Particularly points that out. He says, remember Lot's wife. What is there to remember about her? Remember, Abraham pleads with God concerning Lot because God is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and he has disclosed this matter to Abraham, his friend, the only friend that God had on this earth. So Abraham says, wait a minute, my brother's son is out there living in that town. Don't destroy him with the rest. So God obliges him. God sends angels and they go and talk to him and those guys are not ready to leave. They, are, they have found such an attachment to Sodom and Gomorrah. They liked Sodom and Gomorrah. They've been living there for a while, having a good life, you know. Got married, kids got married there and everything there, you know. So they have become people from Sodom and Gomorrah. That's their ID. So they're not ready to leave. Finally, you know, the angel said, no, we can't leave you here because of Abraham's sake. You know, God says to get you out. Come out. They're not coming out. So the angels went and took them by the hand, the Bible says, dragged them out of town and told them to keep running and keep going and said, do not turn back and look. It's all a picture of how God delivers us from this world and from the destruction of this world and the judgment that is coming upon this world that is filled with the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and, and so on. Don't turn back. But Mrs. Lot had such an attachment to Sodom. They're running this direction. She was looking back, you know. She just could not forget Sodom, you know. She, her eyes were upon Sodom. She just loved Sodom for some reason. You know, she just could not part with this thing. She has become one with that lifestyle, I guess. She's just looking back and became a pillar of salt. Jesus says, remember Lot's wife. Why? Don't look back. The kingdom of God. For a person who looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is not like what we think, not, what, not, not like what that fellow thought when he said, I want to come wherever you go. Because he was thinking of the kingdom as some kind of a key position, key post that he can get and all of that. No, the kingdom is about the Son of Man coming to save the lost. It's about salvation. It's about getting back with God, a relationship with God, and the blessings of God flowing into man's life as a result of that. That is the key. This is different. It works differently. The kingdom works differently. It's not just getting some post and some, some, something from that. No, it is getting right with God and thereby the blessings of God coming on that person. What is the kingdom of God? The second guy shows the kingdom of God is something that you cannot put off. You have to give it top priority. When you know the truth, you must enter into it without any delay. You can't say, I go out into this, that, and all that. No, you need to enter into it without any delay. And the third guy shows, that case shows that the kingdom of God is 
something where you need to completely focus your attention and look and keep going in that direction, concentrate and not look back. You need to totally and unreservedly give yourself to Jesus and not hold anything back. Your heart cannot be in that and then follow Jesus. You cannot be little bit over there and little bit over here, one leg over there and one leg over here. You need to completely give yourself to Christ and follow him. That is what the kingdom of God. When you do that, then he is your king and then the kingdom's blessings belong to you and all the, all the things of the kingdom you begin to take part in and you'll be blessed in this life and in the life to come. Say that, confess that. Lord, you're more than enough for me. Lord, you're more than enough for me. Let's just raise our hands and say that. Lord, Lord, you're more than enough. 